Are you looking for true personal freedom? The freedom to design the life you truly desire? Then you're absolutely in the right place. True personal freedom comes from when you take 100% responsibility and control of your money and your mind. Here, you're going to learn ideas, tips, and wisdom that's going to help you bridge the gap from where you are now to your dream life in the future. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And in today's episode, I'm super excited. I've got Philip Work with us today. Uh, Philip is a serial entrepreneur. He's a husband. He's a father. He's actually a grandfather, if you can believe it, if you're watching this on video. He might not have wanted me to share that, but I did anyways. Anyways, he's a, a real estate investor. He's an educator. He's everything when it comes to uh, financial education, personal freedom, all of the things that we stand for here at the podcast. So I'm super excited to dive into this uh, conversation with Philip, learn more about him, learn more about his techniques, what he's seen in, in kind of in the markets today. Uh, but for that, we'll get into the conversation as we go. But for now, uh, Philip, welcome to the show. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate you having me on. And I've heard a lot about your group and your followers. So just here to add value and see what I can impart some wisdom and things that I've learned from the School of Hard Knots over the years. So Thanks for having of me this, of that school. And yeah, I, we've all been there. Right. So can you give a little bit, everybody, a little bit of a uh, little bit of background? Like who is Philip? Where have you come from? Where are you now? You know what I mean? Those and kind of fill in the gaps there a little bit. Well, I mean, now I'm just an old grandpa, you know, so, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, Randy, I, I, we started young, you know, we started young, my wife, Lindsay and I, we met in high school. We got married shortly after we were 21 when we had our first child. And then you know, she started young as well. So that made us, you know, some pretty young grandparents. Am I frozen? Okay. Um, but anyway, as far as my journey goes, you know, I remember back in, I think it was 1997, I was in high school and I had asked my dad, I said, Hey dad, what do you think it would take for me to buy a house if I decide to go to college so I can rent the rooms out to my friends and then I can live for free. Basically that was my idea. I was like, Oh, and he was like, well, well, son, I think if you uh, get good credit and save up a good down payment and keep your job and th these kind of things, and maybe a 20% down, you'd be able to purchase a house and, and do that. I think that's a great idea. So that's what I was going to do. I was going to wait for a year and sit back and, you know, work and continue building my credit and save that money for a down payment and just go to like junior college in town. But then one night I was watching late night television and I saw an infomercial and there was an old man sitting against a bar stool and he was talking about his home study course, how to buy houses with no money and no credit. I'm like, okay, well, that sounds like a shortcut. So I ordered that course. This was 1997. I was still a senior in high school. You know what I mean? And that really just kind of started my journey. And it led me down, you know, like to like call on sellers, looking for motivated sellers, looking for deals, all these creative financing techniques. And uh, I was following this script because he had me calling sellers out of the newspaper. <laughs> this is 97, right? Like find ads in the paper and I'm calling and I'm reading these scripts and asking all these questions. And I remember one day this lady answered the, she's like, Philip, are you reading from a Carlton Sheets script? And I'm like, how the heck did you know? Right. So I think this was a common thing back then. But anyway, she introduced me to the Real Estate Investment Club of Houston, which led me down this path of just continuing my education and learning from other real estate investors and gurus that were out there teaching this business, which ultimately led to somebody there at that group handing me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And this was like in, I think, 2000, 2001, when I got a hold of that book. And that totally changed my whole mindset around what you're talking about, the financial education and assets over liabilities. And that was a game changer for me as well. So that's just kind of the snippet of my, my story there. Yeah, that's awesome. And we'll get a, a little bit deeper as we go, because as you've progressed, right, you've stacked on different uh, businesses, right? You've started them, you've sold them, you've rebought them, you've started stopped right now you're in this uh, large uh, airbnb space flipping houses type space as far as with the real estate investments and i know you have some some uh, long-term rentals as well so yeah super excited to dive in yeah a bit so, further. so yeah i mean we started from from that right like calling these motivated sellers looking for those creative finance deals those motivated sellers that we could take over their payments own financing and those kind of things and we've done everything from buying buy and hold rentals, buy, fix, and flip, you know, like everything from short sales to owner finance, lease options, the creative deals. 
And you're right. Right now, we're concentrating pretty big on the short-term rental space, doing fully furnished Airbnbs. Super excited to dive deeper into that with you for sure. But before we get into all that juicy goodness, let's get into the three questions that I try to ask all of our guests, all of my guests to try to give a little, there again, a little bit more context, context of uh, who you are, kind of how you think, that kind of thing. But the first off, or the first question is, who has been the biggest influence in your life, Philip? Well, I'm going to have to say my dad, you know, that, that father figure, uh, my father has definitely been the biggest influence. So I don't know if you know this about me, Randy, but I grew up on the mission field. My parents were missionaries in Brazil. So the first 10 years of my life, I lived in Rio, Brazil as a missionary's kid. Uh, my mom was actually born on the mission field, 1955 in Brazil. And she spent her whole childhood all the way through high school uh, in Brazil, right? And then she met my dad at Baptist Bible College in, in uh, Springfield, Missouri. And they got married up there, had my brother and my sister. And then, um, and then we moved here to Pasadena, Texas, where I was born. And then shortly after I was born, we moved to Brazil. And like I said, we spent the first 10 years of my life there. And my dad took, you know, he took, he in college, he also took like business classes, right? So he had a minor in business, right? So he was an entrepreneur from, from the get-go running a church and being a missionary, that's an entrepreneur endeavor. You know what I mean? So we took over the church that my grandparents had started. Dad planted two or three other churches down in Brazil. And I remember we'd always come back from the mission field every few years to visit the churches that supported us to raise more support because that's what he had to do back then, like raising money from, from other churches to send us on the mission for him to build churches and continue that. Um, after we got off of the mission field back in 1990, we, we moved back to the States and dad took over a Brazilian church. And then from there, he ended up starting a business with one of the members of the churches. And, um, you know, and that was an entrepreneur thing. I was 15 at the time when he started that business and having moved here from Brazil, like in literally fifth grade, I didn't know how to read or write in English. I could speak English. But I went those first few years of my life to Brazilian schools, learning to read and write in Portuguese. And so anyway, when I, you know, I, I was trying to, you know, get along with all the kids and play sports and all of those things. And I, I just couldn't jive with them. I couldn't fit in. So I went to work with that instead. So I worked side by side with him in that business. So I saw firsthand since I was like in junior high, what it took to run businesses and be an entrepreneur. And, you know, I ended up losing my dad um, when I was 20. He was only 44 years and he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, diagnosed in January, passed away in April, 44 years young. But that forced me to grow up a little bit faster than most people. I had already been working with him through entrepreneurship. Um, but when, you know, he passed away at 20 and I, I was forced to grow up quick, right? So that's when I, you know, shortly after that, got married to my wife, ended up buying the business that he had started from my mom so that I could run the business for her. And so I've been literally on my own running businesses since I was 20 years old. And, you know, I was blessed with the opportunity to purchase that business from my mom, because what happened was after dad passed, she was trying to run that business, but she had been a preacher's wife, a stay at home mom. She never knew how to run a business. And I saw her struggling with that. And I had already started learning some of these creative financing things through the courses that we talked about. And so I remember on dad's deathbed, he was still holding on, you know, holding on really tight. And, and I told him, I was like, dad, I'll, I'll take care of mom. You know, I'll, I will, I'll take care of mom. And that's literally, he took his dying breath after I spoke that into his ear, you know? And uh, so anyway, I, I was able to do the creative financing things, bought the business from my mom with some owner financing and things like that. So literally since dad passed away through her investments with me in real estate and that business, I've been able to support her hundred percent. Now she works a little bit in the business and she helps out a lot, you know what I mean? But she's been completely passive through those investments, but dad was definitely the biggest influence, you know, his work ethic, everything that he taught me growing up, you know, um, yeah, definitely my father. So <laughs> that's a super cool story. Uh, we've got that connection. I think we've talked about in the past. My dad died from the same thing. He was almost, but it was very similar in the fact that, that it was very quick like that. He found out in June of 2014 and passed by December very quick, right? So I resonate 100% with that story, man. And, and, and also part of that story, my mom passed, unfortunately, too, with breast cancer. And I, at her, on 
when she was about to pass, I was sitting with her and shared with her that it was okay. It was, a, it was time to go that I would take care of everything, right? That was the kind of the, I would, the so the same themes, wow. I know exactly what you're saying and how challenging those times are, but being able to take the wisdom then that you've gained, as you mentioned, from your dad, right? To be able to then take the Carlton Sheets, you know, types of, of ways to be creative with money, uh, turning that challenge into a, a, uh, a positive. I know at the time, I'm sure it wasn't pleasurable and I'm not implying that it is even today, but at the same time to try to take something that was a definite uh, negative and try to turn it into a positive, I'm sure it was a, a, a big experience for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I am, I am because of that influence, you know, yeah. and everything that I went through and I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change my mission field growing up in Brazil as a missionary's kid. I wouldn't change, like I wouldn't change anything. You know what I mean? So that's awesome. And it, this might lead into the se second question. And if it piggybacks off something you've already discussed, fantastic. We can go a little deeper. Or if you want to keep a little shorter, that's that's the same too, or that's fine as well. But as far as your greatest challenge, can you think of like what your greatest challenge has been and what you've learned from that challenge? So greatest challenge, and I, honestly, I would say the biggest challenge is self-doubt. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like having that imposter syndrome for example right like putting yourself out there doing things like this and you know yeah so that that would def definitely be the biggest challenge and so through the real estate trainings and all of these things it kind of led to a lot of like personal development things right like your Tony Robbins your Brendan Burchards and you know all these guys that that teach personal development think and grow rich right all of those those books. And I think that's been a, a huge part, you know, Jim Rohn and his, his things that he talks about, like, and I, I still listen to that stuff. Like literally I was listening to uh, how to win friends and influence people this week. Right. And just kind of like re-listening to things like that, re-listening to think and grow rich and reading that, that book. So a lot of those things really help with that mindset. So I think the biggest challenge has, has really been like, just to, to have the confidence to go out there and, and do what I do. Right. And I've been doing this Randy real estate now, you know, 20, 23 years, full time since December of 2003. And, uh, I've just been quietly doing it, not really talking about it as much and showing people the way. And I think, uh, yeah, that's been the biggest challenge is putting myself out there. That yeah, fear. That's, a huge, that's a huge challenge. And I think a lot of us can, can resonate with that as well. Uh, even including myself, for sure. I'll raise my hand on that one too. Right. But being willing right. to, to do the work, right. The personal development piece, which is another big component of what we talk about here on the podcast is the ability to take information and wisdom from others. And then to gain that confidence, to be able to step forward, lean into the challenge versus pulling back from it is, is a big piece as far as uh, getting to this supposed mountaintop, right. That you might be trying to climb from either from a financial standpoint, or even just from a personal standpoint it really depends. Yeah. And I, you know, and if, if you think about it, like there's still challenges literally every day, every single day, there's challenges, there's struggles. I'm on this financial mountaintop, right? I have the financial freedom. I've got all of those things, but it all comes with hard work and dedication. And, you know, this dream that they were selling. And if you look at, you know, a lot of people on social media and they, you know, brag about their planes or they're working from the beach and the, you know, this lifestyle, the four hour work week, for example, yeah, you can implement a lot of things in those, those kind of trainings and those books. But the reality is I, I grind every day because I love what I do. Right. And there's challenges. There's days where I hate what I'm doing. There's things that I have to do in my business that I don't like and that I don't enjoy, but I, you know, I, I'm every day going after it, but there's struggles every day. Right. So if there wasn't any risk, there wouldn't be any reward. Right. If there wasn't the struggle, there wouldn't be the mountaintop. So we just keep climbing, keep going, you know, and uh, I think, I think I heard the other day, um, life doesn't get easier. We just get tougher. <laughs> so I was, I was told something very similar to that yesterday, as a matter of fact, right? The idea wow. of climbing Mount Everest, right? And you've got to, once you make that next level, you've got to actually retreat a little bit, get yourself acclimated to the, to the climate, to the pressure, right? Of, of right. raising yourself that it's, it's a continuous climb, but sometimes you've got to pull back and just kind of uh, get yourself ready for that next excursion up the journey, up the ladder, whatever, whatever you choose, right? Whether you're going for personal freedom, financial freedom, um, whether you're trying to leave, uh, leave a job, uh, maybe a, a toxic relationship, you know, anything that can be going on in a person's life, it just takes courage.
courage takes uh it's definitely a journey that's for sure yeah and we can't get to the next level doing the same thing that we were doing to, that got you to this level so there's all, always this constant growing and learning something new and just challenging yourself right and I, I, I used to think that by now I'd be retired. You know what I mean? Like I'm the retire young, retire rich. And here I am 43 years old and I'm like, I'm just getting started. <laughs> you exactly. know? Exactly. Well, speaking of that, as far as going back and trying to uh, leave some nuggets, I always try to leave the listeners with a nugget of wisdom, something that you wish you would have known back when you were 20. You mentioned that you've been doing this for 20 years. So that was basically right when you were in your early twenties. Yeah. If you could take, what you've learned in your 20 years experience and go back to your 20 year old self. Is there a nugget of wisdom that you just wish that you would have known or that you could convey to yourself back then that um, would definitely have, have fueled your, your path right up this rocket ship or up this mountain even faster than what you've already been able to do. Is there anything? Yeah, definitely. So the, the, the main thing that comes to mind, like if I were to go back and talk to my 20 year old self, what would I tell me? And I would basically say to seek mentor sooner and that there are really people out there that will help you find the, somebody that's already gone and done and achieved what you want to do. And back then I was doing it through these, you know, courses, right? I was doing it through seminars, through books, through tapes, through online or home study courses back then, right? But I didn't realize that those people actually wanted to help. And a lot of people think even now, like, oh, that's, that's fake. They just want your money. They don't believe in coaching. They don't believe in going to a seminar for the weekend and getting the training and getting the education because they think that those people are just in it for the money. Oh, if it was so good, why would they be teaching it? And I fell into that trap when I was getting started, right? And I tried to go alone for a long time. I went alone, right? Even in, when I went full-time in December of 2003, I had done two or three deals a year. Alone, I was doing two or three deals a year. When I started getting coaching and getting mentoring, I went from doing two or three a year to doing two or three a month. Right. And that's when it really started going. And even now I have coaches that are ahead of me that are doing more than me. I'm always trying to learn from somebody that's that's doing more. And yeah, there's a price for admission. I have to pay. Right. They do get compensated for for doing that. Um, but it's worth it. Right. Having that accountability, somebody that is holding your hand, telling you and showing you the way and and helping you get to the next level. That accountability counts. Right. And we pay attention to what we pay for, right? So I could coach you all day for free and we can just give each other free advice, but rather you go implement it or not, that's up to you. And most people, if they don't pay for the advice, they're not going to implement it. But when you put your money on the line and you pay for that advice and you've got them holding you accountable, well, you've got to get a return on your investment. So that payment of having a coach or a mentor in your life will actually give you a return on investment because it'll hold you accountable to go out there and do it. So that's what I would tell my younger self, like have coaches in your corner, somebody that you can call and bounce ideas off of somebody that's already done what you're trying to achieve and always seek coaches and mentors, whether it's personal development, health, wellness. I've got a personal health and wellness coach. And right now I'm down 35 pounds from my high a few, you know, six months ago. And, you know, I message him every day. Here's my, my scale. Here's my weight. Here's my body fat. Like here's my blood sugar levels. And every day we're making adjustments, you know, now, if I wasn't messaging him every day, I probably wouldn't be taking it as serious. And I probably wouldn't have gotten as much of the results. Right. And then it's the same with my, you know, my personal, you know, uh, business and un real estate coaches that I, that I have. So. Yeah. So even at that level that you're at having the, uh, the team members, let's say that it's on your side, right. I get it that you're, you're trading dollars for their, resources, right? Or their uh, uh, coaching, support, accountability, all of those things. But can you talk about, a lot of times I feel, and I fell into this trap, the idea of, of wanting to just do it all on my own, do it by myself. I can figure it out. I can do this. I can do that. Can you tie in? Because that's how I think about with coaches, right? They're, they're part of your team. Right. Can you talk about how important it is to develop a team uh, with even a company of your size, or even as you scale up, as you've worked with other folks, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So talking about doing it by yourself, I think people have this idea that they can, they can do more by themselves or they can go faster, but I can guarantee you, like when you're with other people, you can go further, a lot further, you know, a lot faster. And like, I'll think about like, even like your experience with real estate too. Right. And a lot of what we would do over the years is like work with private investors 
you know, or hard money lenders and pay them eight to 12% return on their capital, for example, right? So if they put up the money, we give them a good return secured by real estate on their capital, eight to 12%, that's kind of standard in the industry. Well, what I've realized recently is that if I have private money partners as, a pri as opposed to private money lenders, I can do more. I can serve more people in making them partners. I would rather have 50% of 100 deals than 100% of my own, right? Because it scales bigger. I can go faster. I can do more deals simultaneously at a time. And that's what takes me from being able to do just a few deals a year to doing a few deals a month. We're literally renovating six houses right now. You know, and we've got several houses on the market, several pending closing that are going to be closing that we've sold that have gone full circle. And I've got private money partners on that. And I'll share the profits with them so that we can do more and be more. And not only that, but it's helping me, it's helping them, right? Because a lot of people have, you know, this desire to invest in real estate. And I believe everybody should invest in real estate at some capacity. And I understand not everybody wants to do real estate full time and quit their job in 90 days and just be a real estate entrepreneur like me, right? But some people might have a great job. They love it, but they have some investment capital, but they don't have the time, right? So if they don't have the time, but they have the investment capital and they still want in, well, they can partner with somebody like you or me where they put up the money, we do all of the work, and then we share in the profits, right? And so that's, that's, what, that's what I would say, you know, like to go faster, have those coaches, those team members, partners, and just build a team around. You can't do it all by yourself. And you absolutely yeah. cannot do it all by yourself. It's uh, that was one thing that was ingrained in me growing up. Um, my programming was to do it by myself, right? Do all of the, even the chores around the house and, and breaking free from that has been a huge challenge because it's really ingrained in a lot of us as we're growing up. So to find uh, ways and find folks that are doing it at scale, right? like you mentioned, you've got six, six projects going on at one time. Can you give us just a point of reference as far as like uh, team members within your own personal real estate team? How many, how many team members does it take to run your operations? And, and I know you've got multiple operations, right? right? I mean, can you give anybody some context as far as like, it, okay, you've got six projects going on. How many team members does it take to do that? Well, the, the main team member right now is my wife. Yeah, <laughs> my there you wife. Go. And, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out, hey, how can we let her like, cause she's wanting to be a grandma and she's wanting to kind of put the brakes on and I'm still trying to, to grind and grow, um, you know, but she's been a huge part. Like we've lived together and worked together and been together 24 seven for the past 22 years of marriage. You know what I mean? So, uh, but she's a huge asset to the business and she does a lot of the uh, interior decorating design ideas and things like that. She's got a, an amazing touch and I don't want to lose her in the business, but I don't want to lose her as a wife either. Right. right. So yeah. let's figure out what sure. we need to do to let her only focus on her passions. And it starts with, for me, it starts with delegating those, those minimum wage activities, those redundant things. A lot of the things that she does that don't really add value, but it's things that have to get done, like helping with bookkeeping and accounting and managing all of that stuff. Right. So I've got my wife, um, we've hired a personal assistant to help with that. A lot of the things as far as team can be in the real estate business can be like contract late. It's not like they don't work for us, like, like W2, they're 1099, right? So we've got all of our trades, whether it's electricians, plumbers, roofers, carpenters, painters, you know, so there's a, a huge team there to help with the renovations. Uh, we've got a personal assistant in the office and she's also a licensed real estate agent. And we've just recently, you know, hired her. She's replacing the last personal assistant that we had. Um, we have a bookkeeper. We've got, uh, well, we talked about coaches. So I've got a, a, a wealth, you know, a, a, basically a CPA, but he's more on the advisory side of things, um, you know, guiding us on, on what, to, what to sell, what not to sell, investments and how to do our taxes and things like that. Um, I've got a virtual assistant in the Philippines that helps me with a lot of my social media and branding and a lot of stuff like this. And we, we talk almost every day and constantly working on tasks together. Um, but it's, it's a lot, it's a huge team we've got with our Airbnb business, you know, we've got a team of virtual assistants that's managed by the company that I use that does all of our guest communications. And I just kind of manage them. And then we've got cleaning ladies that come and clean the houses and handyman that you know, go like do little repairs and fix ups and things like that. But I mean, I think last count, we had like 15 people just in that company, like cleaning ladies, handymen and things like that. And that's the part that my mom helps with, right? She loves 
helping and coordinating the cleaning ladies and figuring out who needs to be where, when during check-ins. You know, like we're running a hotel out of 20 something houses, right? So it's a lot of, you know, a lot of maintenance and upkeep and cleaning, but it's, yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun having, you know, friends, family, and people within the business supporting those, those efforts. But yeah, that's super um, inspiring. That's awesome. Yeah. So folks that are are sitting there listening to us today, and they might feel a little bit overwhelmed, right? I mean, you, you talk about, and that's why I wanted you, and I appreciate you going as deep as you did, because that's what I wanted to paint some, some a picture in people's mind as far as what could be. And granted, remember, folks, we're talking about 20 years of experience here. This didn't happen overnight, right? right. You went through 08, all that catastrophe with the banks. And I mean, whether or not we're kind of going through something similar, I'll be curious to get your opinion maybe here in a minute. But yeah, the idea that this is overnight, that's not, this isn't a get rich quick. This is not, but my point that I wanted to try to drive home was that it takes people. It takes, you've got to learn how to leverage other people's time, other people's resources, other people's experiences, other people's systems, right? You'll hear me talk about that a lot, a lot on the podcast. And I just wanted to have Philip kind of go into detail how deep his processes with his people and his team and his systems are. So kind of then reeling that back then, Philip, I would love for you, to, I know you coach folks from the very beginning. That's something that you're very super passionate about now. It's like you've gotten your business to the point where it's, it's scaling almost, I don't want to say on its own, but you've gotten some systems and processes, the people, the team, right? That are, they're churning away, getting this things built on, you know, your little system in the background, but you've gone out now and you're helping folks from the beginning. Say they get a little spark. It's like, yeah, what Philip's talking about that's what I want to learn how to do. Right. But I, but I'm at zero where I'm at, you know, what, are, let's call it just the beginning phases of the process. Can you, is there any advice, uh, any ideas? I know you offer some coaching programs yourself, but is there anything you would uh, like to say to those folks that maybe just to be any, but this is something that's like, just yes. going, Oh yeah. I want yeah. to know more so, about that. I mean, it's going to start with the desire, right? So you've got the, you've got the idea. you have like, okay, I think I can do that. Or I want to give it a try. Um, and then you're going to be, on one or two paths. You either have money and credit and you're going to start investing with somebody that's actually actively doing it and partner with them to kind of learn the business and go that way. Or you have no money and credit like I didn't when I was 17 years old, right? So if you have no money and credit, you're going to start by doing a lot of the grind. You're going to be doing the phone calls and the mailers and doing everything that I did in the beginning to find those motivated sellers. It all starts with the motivated seller. And I like to say it's a motivated seller is somebody that needs to sell their house so bad that it's like literally the most important thing in their life at that moment, right? Those are the people that we can help. The guy that can list, market, and sell with a real estate agent and wait three to six months for the house to sell, that's not our seller. That's a referral to a real estate agent, right? But the person that needs to sell because they're behind on payments or facing foreclosure or going through a divorce or maybe they got a job transfer, they're tired of being landlords, you know, from, from bad tenants and things like that. Those are the sellers that, that we're looking for, right? So then we have to think about, okay, are you a passive investor? Like you have money and credit and you just want to be passive or are you that investor that has more time, right? And then basically build a blueprint for them for figuring out um, the best path for them. And then is it, hey, do you want to do a house a month? A house a week, you know, two or three a year, right? Because there's a different strategy, a different blueprint for each of those methods. And whichever one you choose, we have to back into figuring that out. And the one you choose is the one that you have to determine on your own. Like, hey, what are you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve financial freedom through what they call passive income? Well, I believe passive income is a lie, right? Like if you think about, I'm going to buy a bunch of rent houses. Let's say you need to replace $10,000 a month income. And let's say the average rent house cash flow is $250 a month, or let's say 500 a month. How many houses is it going to take for you to replace that $120,000 a year? Well, at 10,000 a month, $500 a month, that's 20 houses. How long is it going to take you to accumulate 20 rent houses so you can retire? Well, if you want to retire in a year, it's like, crap, you're going to have to buy a couple houses a week, right? But the reality is, is that $500 gets eaten up by vacancies. It gets eaten up by that phone call. Hey, the air conditioner went out. Now you got to spend six grand replacing an air conditioner. Right. So that's why I say it's a lie and it's not passive. Yeah. You're going to buy the house and rent it and they're going to pay the rent every month, but you have to manage that tenant. You have to manage the breakdown you have to manage. So it's not really fully passive. The passive investor is the guy that actually has money, gives it to somebody else. And then that money comes back with friends, right? <laughs> he invested the money, did none of the work 
and then the money comes back. That's that's passive. But anyway, once you decide the goal, like how much money do you want to make, how fast do you want to make it, then we can make a blueprint and kind of kind of figure it out. And I like to say that the most important thing in a real estate investor's job description is talking to sellers, getting houses under contract, negotiating those deals, and then raising private money or making those relationships with the money, the partners that want to actually do deals with you. That's your most important job. Mowing the lawn on the weekend, that's not your job. Give that job to the neighborhood kid that wants to make 25 bucks, right? Doing the laundry, like cleaning your house, all of these things, right? So the first thing I would say is to min like eliminate all of those minimum wage activities, put people in place to do that, but not so you can sit on the couch and watch TV, right? I'm not going to have some kid mowing the lawn so I can just sit back and chill. It's so that I can work on those higher use of my time activities, right? Talking to sellers, putting deals together. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. It sure does. So, yeah. and, and hopefully we'll get into uh, more detail about your coaching programs and things here towards the end of the podcast. So I know folks are going to be interested in learning more from you because your wealth of knowledge is just, it's, it's extensive. And as you mentioned, you're actively pursuing and doing six deals or six houses, right? Six, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the word I'm trying to use here as far as like uh, you've got six active things that you're working on right now within the space, right? Not on top of everything else that you've got going on. Right. Which yeah, that's just then, renovations. That's just yeah. the houses under renovation. We've got yeah. houses listed for sale. We've got 23 listings on Airbnb right now, right? So we're managing, like, it's, it, yeah, it's a lot, it, right? But it all started, with, it starts with one. Starts with one. It starts with that first deal, that one deal, whether it's partnering with somebody uh, or doing it, you know, doing it on your own with some coaching and some, some guidance. Yeah, of course. So then that leads me to the next question, whereas, uh, this, at the time of this recording, we're towards the end of, of March 2023, for those who might be listening in the future, uh, but kind of put a little bit of a timestamp on it. But the economy is kind of a, you know, up, down, sideways, the real estate market, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? I mean, everybody, that's kind of the, the normal talking points that you hear in the, in the uh, mainstream media, let's say. You've got boots, boots on the ground. You're actually, you're working with crews, you're working with projects, as we've discussed, you're actively working with folks, teaching them how to do this. What say you? Do you have an opinion? I know you're in the Houston, uh, Texas market, which I know, you know maybe not relate to every single market in the country, but do you have a, a feel, a sense of kind of what's going on out there as far as some wisdom that you might be able to share with folks? Yeah. And so, I mean, I listen to a lot of people, right. And I go to a lot of trainings. I still do to this day and I get a lot of coaching and, you know, real estate's local for one, right? So yes, the, the national economy, presidents, all of these things, elections, everything affects it. And what we experienced in the past year was like interest rates going from record lows of two, almost 3% to like six, 7%. So it's never increased so fast over, over such a short period of time, right? So that's really changing the market. It's changing it from, we were in a uh, um, a seller's market where you list a house and you get 10 offers over asking, they're waiving inspections, waiving inspection periods, not asking for any repairs, competing bids, right? So just driving prices up like crazy. Um, and then it shifted. Now we're more in a, in a buyer's market where it's like, hey, we can actually offer a little bit less than what they're asking. We can ask them to do some repairs. We can do these things. So houses are sitting a little bit longer, taking a little bit longer to sell, maybe even dipping in price 5, 10, 15 20% from where they were a year ago, right? I remember since I was very getting started, it was like, hey, real estate always goes up in value, right? So if you look at real estate as a five-year, 10-year, historically, it's slowly climbing. You might have dips where it goes down 5, 10, 15%, or like what happened in 2008, where the market really, really crashed when Lehman Brothers and that whole banking fell apart and yeah, we took a huge bath in, in, in that little dip and we can talk a little bit more about that. But we always have to be prepared to pivot, like know what market we're in, know what we need to do, because there's strategies that work in any of these markets, you know. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So in 2008, when the market crashed, I had set out to, to literally I was buying a house a week. So in 2008, um, when the market crashed, we had 57 houses on the books. And we were buying a house a week. And what I was doing is I was buying the houses, not getting a lot of cash flow on each house. We we're happy to get $200, $300 a month cash flow per house. 
But I realized that by selling these houses to a renter, so I would have put a rent to own tenant buyer in the house. And I thought, okay, once I help them a year down the road, fix their credit a year or two down the road, they'll buy the house from me. And then I'll get that big profit, the big back end. I'll make a $25,000 check or a $30,000 check. And so I was like, I think this is going to work. So I set out to do that. And I wanted one or two or three a month cashing me out. So I was like buying and buying and buying and putting these tenant buyers. But what happened was the 08 market crashed. And instead of these people buying the houses from me, I started getting houses back. Like they couldn't afford it. The market crashed. Their purchase price was higher than the market values. So I started getting houses back and we, we couldn't handle it. Right. So we had a, a lot of struggle. We had to fix them up again. You know, they had been living in the house two or three years. So now we had to repaint it, recarpet it, all these things. Right. So that was a, a huge struggle. But what I learned from that is that all of the houses I held on to after 2008 and the few that I bought after that, within five years, they had like almost doubled in value. Right. So it did come back up. So with real estate, as long as you can cover your debt with the monthly income from the rental or whatever that may be, and you don't have to sell, you can hold on long enough to where you can wait a year or two or three for the market to recover and get back to where you can actually sell it at that point. So always buy based on like knowing that, hey, I'm getting a good deal today when I purchase it. We make our money when we buy. We buy houses below market value, right? So we're buying houses that need renovations that we can fix up and bring it to full market value. So we're building in some equity by buying it below market value. And then we're also buying it in a position where we know that the monthly rent can cover the monthly payment. So that way I can hold it for a year or two or three and then sell it later. And then now we've combined that with Airbnb. So instead of tenant buyers that I'm putting in on a rent to own that don't take care of the house and two years later, I got to renovate it again. I'm fully furnishing these houses, making little hotels out of them putting them on Airbnb, we might get two or three times more rent than we would have if it was a long-term rental. But we also get to see the property. Our cleaners are in there. Our maintenance man is in there, you know, almost every week, sometimes multiple times a week doing those turnarounds. So we're able to keep up with the deferred maintenance, which means that our houses are always ready to sell. Like I can turn the switch off on the Airbnb, put it on the MLS, fully furnished. It shows great. There's no deferred maintenance. Our buyers come in and literally in this buyer's market, the last three houses that we've put on the market, we've had multiple offers where we had to compete and then we end up selling it more than what we listed it for. Where everybody else is dropping their price 5, 10% and it's sitting on the market for 60, 90, 120 days, we're getting full price offers within a week, multiple competing bids, right? Because our houses are furnished, they show well. And on top of that, like I'm not in a hurry because I have it on Airbnb. So like I'll, li I'll literally we're closing on the fifth and we've got guests coming in and out of that property the whole time we're under contract. So the 30 days between contract to close, we're still generating rental income, right? So it's beautiful. That is, so you taking us through that, that, that journey, right? Of all of that, that's just fantastic. Cause I'm just like picturing all of the pieces and parts kind of making all that up as far as uh, the different portions of your projects, right? Leading into the Airbnbs. And then just that last piece of the story, as far as, I mean, you're literally collecting rent, right? Because people are staying in your property all the way up until the day that you close. Yeah. And then that person, so then obviously you're going to get a payday when that, that, that sale transaction takes place. And then you can go do that again and replicate it right through your processes, through your yeah. systems that you've already got in place. Right? Yeah, exactly. And like, literally we've got it planned. We're closing on the fifth. I got a two day lease back from them because I don't want to take the whole thing down before closing. So until the, until the money hits the bank and I know it's actually closed, we're going to operate that Airbnb. So I got a two day lease back from them. So the day after closing, we'll go pack up the house. The day after that, we'll have a moving company there and they'll be there packing the house, moving it to a project that we're completing. And this has happened multiple times lately where we're closing on a house, packing it, we just finished a renovation on the next one. We're moving all of that furniture to the next property. And we have that house up and running on Airbnb within a week. So it's just, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing pipeline. And, you know, it's something that I've been building. Like I started on the Airbnb journey in November of 17 and really started furnishing these houses and doing all these things. But the past year or so is when I've really landed on this method of doing it. The same thing that I was trying to do back in 2004 until 2008 when the market crashed, but 
instead of rent to own buyers, it's fully furnished houses on Airbnb. And then building this pipeline, I'll, I'll buy it, fix it, furnish it, put it on Airbnb for a year. Then I'm going to evaluate it after I've had it for a year. And I'm going to look at the yield based on, you know, how the property performed over a 12 month period. Is this a home run Airbnb that's really cash flowing so much that the yield, meaning like, hey, the cash flow compared to the value or the cash flow compared to my equity position, how big is that ROI? Is it big enough or can I do better somewhere else? Right. So then I'm, I'll sell that house if it can, if it's not great and it's just getting by. Right. Or if it's just making a, you know, 10, 15, 20% ROI, maybe I'll sell it and take that $50,000 hit and buy two houses with it. Right. So that's, that's what we're doing. And like I said, I've got three houses under, under contract. The pipeline again is to be doing this multiple houses per month where a year from now, which is where we're at now, right? So a year from a year ago, like we're literally listing the houses that are on the market or houses that we've owned for a year or longer. And, you know, we're having closings every month where we're selling these houses that we've owned and then moving them to the next one and just continuing building that pipeline. And the reason I say that is like this, right? So let's say the average flip is a 20% profit on a $250,000 house. Well, the average paycheck I'm going to get after having that house for a year is $50,000, right? So now think about how long would it take to get to your $120,000 a year cash flow? If you, I mean, at 50,000, that's what, one and a half deals, right? So now you're like, oh, I only need to do a deal a quarter or a deal, you know, two or three, four deals a year, right? And build that pipeline. Or you might be like crazy like me and want to do one a week or one a month, but <laughs> either way, uh, either way it works and it's great and you know like we talked about before there's a struggle on everything it's a huge huge task like to think oh my god you're going to renovate the house then you're going to furnish it then you're going to run a hotel with it and then I mean it's a, it's a big lift you know but like like we talked about earlier it takes work and takes dedication I can't do it from the beach yet <laughs> you know so <laughs> and probably at this at that scale <laughs> I don't know if you'll ever be able to do it from the beach 100 right that pot, right. the passive income a goal that everybody has is, uh, you know, whether it's true or not, I mean, it's, it's up for debate for sure, but it's not, if you want to go at scale, if you want to get and, and create some real financial freedom, some personal freedom in your life, it's going to require some work, which hence goes back to what we were talking about, the, the team, which is why I wanted to talk about that. The amount of people and the amount of resources that it takes to accomplish something of this size is, is very good. And having the coaches, you mentioned that as well, as far as starting from the beginning, and you wish you would have gone back and done that sooner. Most folks are afraid to spend the money up front for the coaching, teaching, because they think, once again, they can do it on their own. They can figure this out. Oh, I can go find a house, or I can go make this phone call, or I can go do this, or I can, you know, I can go find a roofer or, or any of the other contractors that you have on staff. And it's not, that's not how if you want to be successful in the real estate world, the secret folks is to find somebody like Philip that's going to be in your corner to help you when the chips are down, when you need somebody that's going to help you, guide you through calling the right person. This is the right contract you need. This is the right team member you need. Whatever it is at that moment, you need a coach like Philip that's going to help you do that. So if someone is sitting out there in the audience today, Philip, it's like, all right, yeah, you're right, Randy, Philip. This real estate thing, I've heard about it. This uh, dream of, of leaving my W-2, I've got to do something. I know you offer coaching for folks. Is there, is there any other places or anything like that? I mean, say somebody wants to learn more from you. Well, what's the best place for people to do that? I mean, honestly, just the easiest place would be to start on my website. Just go to philipwork.com and you can join my newsletter there. I've got some free resources. We can probably share a link to, you know, to some stuff, maybe do set up a phone call and just fill out a little questionnaire for me to, to kind of tell me where you're at, what your goals are. So we can kind of map something out and I'll, I'll do a free 15 minute call with anybody that wants, you know, to kind of learn and see if we're a fit to work together. And, you know, I'll, I'll mention this too, cause like it, it's taken me 20 years to even land on this method. Right. So I've been struggling for 20 years, been successful. Like we don't, have all the fancy cars and fancy things and do all these things like jets and crazy stuff. We've got a family, we've got four kids, right? So I've been able to support a lifestyle that's been comfortable for my wife and I and four kids and now two grandkids. Um, but even my most recent coach, JT Fox, he's the world's number one wealth and business coach. And between his coaching and Hugh Hilton and, 
you know, all of these like crazy successful people that I go to for coaching when the market changed and real estate interest rates were changing, he's, he's the one that said, Hey, Philip, all of these houses and all of these little cash flows, those are great. They'll sound good, but it's time to sell. Like you need to let go of some of those properties, sell them while the market's still hot. And so that's when I landed on this kind of method. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll start selling the ones that I've owned for a year and going through this strategy and him, like, had he not done that and coached me to do that, I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now with what we're talking about because I was in this method of still refinancing all these houses and keeping them. So instead of buying, fix them and sell them, I was buying, fix them, refinance them and hold on to them and hold on to that $500 or a thousand dollars a month cash flow, And all sounded great. But had I not started selling houses, I might've been, you know, kind of struggling and, you know, over leveraged on all of this stuff, right? Cause we need those big hits to continue moving our business forward. And my point is, is that coaching, right? Having somebody that's from a bird's eye view, like looking at your business and seeing what you're doing from an outsider's perspective really helps, you know? So I think a lot of times we know what to do or we think into it, intuitively we, we do, but that one little bit of doubt, not knowing will create the procrastination. And then that could totally kill the whole thing, right? Kill the business or, or cause unneeded stress. But yeah, my website, philipwarrick.com. And, uh, you know, I think by having a conversation with people individually, then I'll know what resources that they need, what I can offer them for free or, you know, help them get to the next level and see if we're a fit, like I said, to, to do some coaching. But That's super valued. So yeah. folks take Philip up on that, uh, reach out to him, get in contact with folks that are at the level or at a level that you aspire to become. You cannot uh, get there. I mean, it's not that you can't, I, that's probably not the right word, but it's going to be a challenge or even more of a struggle for you. If you don't connect yourself, lock arms with folks that are doing what you want to be, uh, if the freedom, if they, if they have the freedom, uh, the family, uh, the connections, the, everything that you're looking for is on the other side of a human being. And Philip here is, is willing to have a conversation with you to try to help you navigate some of those journeys as far as in the real estate space or even in the business space from an entrepreneurial world. He's been an entrepreneur uh, from the beginning of his adult life. So he can definitely share some wisdom there as well. So Philip, I really appreciate your time today. This has been a super valuable conversation. I knew it, I knew it would. As soon as we were able to get this scheduled on, the, on my calendar, I knew that it was going to be a, a fantastic conversation. I hope folks found a lot of value out there. Uh, hopefully you'll have a chance maybe to come back. We can talk about some more of the strategies as we talked about the economy is a little bit in, in some flux. I mean, some things are changing. Maybe some things will come up in the near future. Maybe we can talk about those things in the future as well. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed it as well. Hopefully added some value to people and gave them the desire, right, to go out there and do it. Because I, like I said before, I believe anybody can, everybody should at some capacity be learning about investing in real estate. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. So folks go out there, have a fantastic day, take some action, figure out, get some desire, make a decision, jump on the phone call, uh, jump online, start learning, start gathering some wisdom from folks that are where you want to be and start taking some action. And you'll be surprised at how quickly you can start accumulating, stacking some wins and creating a new life that you at this point, maybe even not, not even seem uh, possible. So go out there, have a fantastic day. I look forward to connecting with you again very soon. We'll talk soon. Thanks now. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. I hope you found a ton of value in this episode. If so, I'd really appreciate a five-star review. And you can also share it with your family and friends. And as my mentor, Jim Roden, shared with me, in order to have more, you must first become more. And in order to become more, you must work harder on yourself than you do on your job. So go out there today and work harder on yourself to become more and build the life of your dreams. Until next time, my friends. Thank you.